From NPR and WBUR, I'm Robin Young. And I'm Tanya Mosley. This is Here and Now. The U.S. government is almost out of cash to pay its bills. Here's Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen speaking earlier today before the Senate Banking Committee. It is imperative that Congress address the debt limit. If not, Treasury will likely exhaust its extraordinary measures by October 18th. America would default for the first time in history. But before Congress can worry about raising that debt limit, it has an even more pressing deadline before the end of the week. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi has scheduled a Thursday vote on a trillion-dollar infrastructure bill, and lawmakers have to come up with a separate plan to fund the government before it shuts down at the end of the week. Let's bring in NPR congressional correspondent Kelsey Snell, who joins us from Capitol Hill. Welcome back, Kelsey. Thanks for having me. We've been here before, a standoff between Democrats and Republicans on how to keep the government running. Just last night, Republicans swatted down a budget bill passed by Democrats in the House. If Congress can't pass something by Thursday, what could happen next? Well, I am told by Democrats in the House and Republicans in the Senate and just about any lawmaker I talk to that they want to avoid that scenario from happening altogether. Both sides say they're committed to keeping the government open. They just seem to disagree on the path to getting there. That said, if they are not able to figure this out, a government shutdown would mean that many government services would not be open. So this is a partial government shutdown. Um, it means that some uh, necessary employees and functions would still be happening, but things like national parks would shut down. Thousands of federal employees would be furloughed without pay. And many of the non-essential government services would just cease to operate until funding is restored. You mentioned both sides are willing to negotiate. What do Republicans say they'd be willing to pass? Well, Republicans say they are um, fully in favor of the government spending bill that Democrats have proposed, but they are not in favor of an additional kind of add-on that uh, Democrats attached in the House, which is a a suspension of the debt limit. Republicans say that if Democrats remove the debt limit provision, that they would be in support of passing a government funding bill that would keep the government open through December 3rd. Uh, It would also include money for natural disasters that have hit uh, parts of the U.S. over the past 18 months, and it would include money for uh, helping resettle uh, refugees from Afghanistan. Okay, what's happening today? What are the two sides doing today to try to reach a a compromise? There's a little bit of a political dance happening today. Uh, We expect that Senate Majority Leader uh, Chuck Schumer is going to try a a procedural way for Republicans to let the debt limit pass without actually voting for that to happen. It doesn't look like that's going to work out. It would essentially need unanimous support from every senator. And Senator Ted Cruz has told some of my fellow reporters uh, that he d- intends to object, meaning that that process won't work. So up next, they have to figure out, Democrats have to figure out amongst themselves if they are willing to move the debt limit to some other bill, likely to uh, the larger spending bill that they are negotiating right now and that they hope to pass uh, using a, a measure and a part of the budget process called reconciliation that would allow them to avoid a filibuster in the Senate and pass it with just Democratic votes. Okay, okay. Then there's this this vote that Pelosi has scheduled for Thursday on, on the $1 trillion infrastructure plan. It already passed the Senate with some Republican support. But progressives don't want to pass it before a much larger bill expanding the social safety net. What sort of risk is Pelosi actually taking here? Well, the interesting thing that has happened over about the past 24 hours is that Pelosi has begun to make the argument that those two bills should not be linked and that essentially she thinks that the the process of getting together a larger spending bill will take too much time and that the bipartisan infrastructure bill, the $1 trillion bill that already passed the Senate, needs to move forward now. She's kind of in the process of convincing progressives to join her, though as I talked to progressives leaving a meeting this morning um, among House Democrats, they were not fully sold on this idea that they need to give up any any elements of their position. That said, there are still a few days left, and it may seem crazy to think that you could move people off from a hardened position or give uh, members a way to accept uh, less than what they were originally asking for in such a short period of time. But that happens in Congress all of the mm-hmm. time. So mm-hmm. we may be up on a mm-hmm. short deadline, but it is not impossible for them to figure this out. I have about 30 seconds with you. So really quickly, I mean, Democrats have a narrow majority in the House, the slimmest possible lead in the Senate. 
Kelsey, are they worried voters may blame their inaction if if they don't meet these deadlines? They are absolutely worried, but I'm not sure that they're worried about these deadlines specifically. They feel like they have to get everything done soon, but I think there is a softening in the position about how quickly it has to happen for voters to really feel the impact of the programs that Democrats want to approve. That's NPR congressional correspondent Kelsey Snell. As always, thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Well, this isn't the first time a president has struggled to pass his legislative agenda, despite his party controlling the White House and both chambers of Congress. Julian Zelizer, presidential historian at Princeton, stops by every week to give us historical perspective. So, Julian, we say lawmakers at a stalemate, Democrats in control, and can't agree with each other. You say, and did say this to us, Jimmy Carter, 1977. Remind us. Sure. Jimmy Carter was elected as president in 1976. Republicans are still in disarray after Watergate. And Democrats control the Senate with 61 seats and the House by 292 seats. And he pushes an energy program. And Democrats are divided. It stalls because of the Democrats. You have Northerners who weren't happy about some of the measures. You have oil state Democrats who didn't want controls on that part of the energy process. And it takes over a year to get a bill. And the final bill is severely watered down. Yeah, but it's something. And it also reminds us that, you know, there was work on climate change all, all those many years ago. And oh, if only it, it could have gone forward in a, in, a, in a bigger way. And by the way, we wish Carter well. He has his 97th birthday this Mm -hmm. Friday. And it's not just Democrats, uh, of course. In 2005, President George W. Bush fought with fellow Republicans over his Social Security proposals. Yeah, after he's reelected, he defeats John Kerry. Uh, Bush famously says, I earned capital in this campaign, political capital, and I intend to spend it. And he pushes for Social Security reform to privatize the system. Republicans control both chambers again. Uh, But the plan is very unpopular. Democrats use this to attack the president. And many Republicans back off pretty quickly because they see just how unpopular it is in the polls. And by the summer, after Katrina happens, uh, the plan is essentially dead in the water. Yeah. Well, let's go to the quintessential backroom dealer, President Lyndon B. Johnson. He struggled for years to get his fair housing plan passed. This is during the civil rights era just coming out of, uh, you know, sort of the Jim Crow era. Many ultra-conservative Democrats were in the Deep South. So remind us what he did and remind us of that time, the context. In early 1966, as Vietnam is accelerating, he pushes the third part of his civil rights trifecta. This is a bill to end discrimination in the sale or rental of housing. Uh, And the civil rights movement, including Martin Luther King, has focused on this issue But once he sends this idea to the Hill in April of 1966, Democrats are deeply divided. And it's not just Southerners. Many Northern Democrats in states like Illinois and cities like Chicago don't want real estate regulated. And it turns into a two-year battle. uh, And he only gets a bill after Democrats have lost seats in the midterm, uh, many prominent Democrats. And the bill, again, is severely watered down by 1968. So he spends a lot of capital and doesn't really get the legislation he hoped for. Yeah. Is there, is there anything that Biden can take from that tale? You mentioned midterms. So anything that he can learn there? Well, sometimes these initiatives will cost you politically, uh, but they might very well be worth it uh, in terms of not only your legacy, but the health of the nation. And Johnson certainly depended on that civil rights movement to sustain his idea over time. And I think Biden can't do this alone, and he can't just do it with his allies on the Hill. Uh, He's going to need activists to get him to the final uh, finish line. But you know, Julian, uh, people always say, but this is different. This post-Trump era, when, you know, we have people who don't even believe in in certain factual things, never mind disagreeing on what's what's you know, they know what's true, but they just disagree on it, that this time is different, that there's something different about this time. Do you agree? Well, it is harder to persuade people. There's fewer persuadables in our electorate. Uh, So really the task for a Biden is to try to keep everyone in the party on board. And the good thing for Biden is the divisions are not as severe as these other cases we've talked about. You're really talking about two senators, uh, Senator Manchin and Sinema. And so 
Uh, I think the lesson is he has to go all in in really leaning and compromising with these senators to get them on board. He's not going to win Republican support. Well, what about the progressives in the party when the in the in the ten year bill or ten year budget yeah. plan? Yeah. Uh, I think uh, I think he's going to have to lean on both sides, but in some ways, I think the progressives are closer to where the overall uh, party agenda is on the two particular bills that we're talking about. Um, so he has to find the middle, not between the parties, but within his party. Historian Julian Zelizer, professor of history and public affairs at Princeton, as always, giving us some context for current events. Julian, thank you. Thanks for having me. R. Kelly faces life in prison after jurors in New York convicted the R&B singer yesterday of racketeering and several counts of sex trafficking. For decades, young women and girls made allegations against Kelly. His suggestive music even alluded to his proclivity for children. And in 2002, Kelly went to trial on charges of making child sex abuse videos. He was found not guilty on all counts. But it wasn't until several investigative reports, including the 2019 documentary Surviving R. Kelly, that prosecutors took another look at the accusations. Dream Hampton is the showrunner and executive producer of Surviving R. Kelly, and she joins us now. Welcome to Here and Now. Thank you. Dream, shortly after the verdict, you tweeted, it was time for this to end. There is a lot in that statement because we're talking about abuse that spans decades. For you, does this feel like justice? I hope that it feels like the beginning of some justice for people of all genders who survived R. Kelly. It's complicated. You know, I'm someone who hasn't spent a lot of my time organizing against sexual and gender violence. I've spent a lot of my adult life organizing against the criminal justice system, um, prisons, police. And so it's not lost on me that, that this is complicated, you know, that the rehabilitation for abusers, for instance, doesn't happen inside prisons. Um, Mm -hmm. I also wish that there was real restitution for these survivors. I know that, Healing is a lot of things. It's messy. It's It could take decades, but it's also expensive, you know? And I think about all of the resources and the money that R. Kelly spent on abusing his victims. He had an ecosystem that was really complicated and included lots of flights and maintaining staff to control half dozen women at a time sometimes. And I just think about all of the resources he spent on his predation and his abuse. And I think about the kind of reporting that's been happening lately around his finances. And I just been thinking a lot about restitution, quite frankly. Your six hour long documentary, I mean, it's considered the most comprehensive look to date of the allegations against Kelly. And you unearth so many stories. I mean, the details that you lay out here about the ways that that he was able to fund these crimes. You heard so many stories from so many women, many of whom were not silent through all of this. I mean, they were speaking out about what happened to them. What surprised you the most about this saga? The work that Jim DeRogatis, for instance, the reporting that he was doing. Chicago writer who was the person who broke the story in 2000 about R. Kelly, accusations against R. Kelly. That's right. But yes, Jim DeRogatis is 25 years of reporting, incredible reporting, you know, by Black women, beginning, quite frankly, with Lola Ogunaki. You know, I can remember her going to Chicago as soon as that local reporting was broken by um, Abner, by Mary, and by Jim DeRogatis. And, you know, so the medium, seeing these women on camera, share their stories and reopen that trauma so that people could could feel as well as hear them. I think it meant something. This is the the first major case, I guess you would say, after the Me Too movement that that is seeking justice for Black and brown women specifically. What impact do you think this verdict might have? I'd like to think that that this means that Black women and girls 
will be taken seriously, you know? And here I'm also talking about extrajudicially. I'm thinking about in our communities. I'm thinking about questions of restorative justice. You know, when women of all races, when victims of sexual crime of all genders go to report these crimes, they are often met with further abuse, quite frankly. There's been so much work done around that. I think of Andrea Ritchie's Invisible No More. I think of the work that Mariam Kaba has done. So I don't know that a trial is some penultimate example of how and where justice can be found. Again, if this brings the victims some relief, if it puts them on a healing journey, then, you know, it brings me It brings me relief also. Dream, you and I are of the same generation. We grew up listening to R. Kelly. I mean, up until very recently, you couldn't go to a party or a backyard barbecue without R. Kelly being on the playlist. I mean, we even see that his music is still receiving millions of downloads. As we sit here and we reflect not only on this conviction, but the last 30 years of R. Kelly, 20 of whom under allegations of sex abuse, how do you reconcile that? How do not only the victims heal, how do we heal? This too is a question for the ages, you know? And and I can't say that I have some clean record on this. I've long stopped listening to R. Kelly, who I consider to be probably the greatest R&B singer of my generation. But it wasn't hard to stop listening to him knowing as early as, you know, 2002 when the tape of him abusing a 14-year-old went viral on the streets pre-internet, it was easy to stop putting money in his pocket, knowing how he was using that money. Um, For those who find it impossible to stop streaming his records, you're right. He's back at 5 million streams a month, which is about his average. Just know that your money will go towards a restitution fund for some of his victims. Um, With a conviction, it changes the dynamics of this whole story when it comes to that, you know, to the financial restitution. The question of art versus artists is an old one. And like I said, I failed many tests. I remember Pearl Clegg from another generation wrote a, a book about Miles Davis after his autobiography was released. And she asked that we boycott him. And I tried and I failed. When I go to the south of France, which I do, You know, I I go and I visit the Picasso Museum knowing that this man, you know, rearranged the interiors of these women's lives in real life, not just on canvas, that he was incredibly abusive. So this is an age old question um, and I don't have the answer to it. But if you are unable to stop listening to R. Kelly, I hope that your money goes towards a victim fund. Dream Hampton is a filmmaker, showrunner and executive producer of the documentary series Surviving R. Kelly. Dream, thank you so much for taking the time to talk with us. Oh, thank you so much. Okay, let's go outside into autumn. Yes, it's officially fall this week. NPR's Brian Mann paddled a wild river in New York's Adirondack Mountains in search of amazing fall color, and he shared this audio postcard. This is the kind of trip you take for deep solitude. The river is hard to reach. I've driven miles of dirt roads to a place in the forest where I slide my little ultralight canoe onto the water. I've set off on Quebec Brook, this winding little river in one of the wildest corners of the Northeast. It's a little hard to navigate, which means people don't come here much. Soon, I'm tangled in a maze of winding marsh, scrambling over big beaver dams that block the way. Pulling the boat over now, kind of perched up on top of this big pile of twigs and branches. I'm paddling in my bare feet today just to make it easier to kind of huck thin my way in and out of this canoe. Fortunately, the water is still holding on to some of its summer warmth. 
the payoff for all this work is total quiet. I'm alone. There's not another soul. No engines, no cell signal to tempt me toward my phone. And there's color. I weave through hidden little ponds surrounded by golden grass. Bright red winterberries glow on the shore. And the bog laurel leaves have turned the color of plums. To go deeper into the wild, I make my way up through a chain of rocky rapids. It's impossible to really paddle the canoe here. So I'm lining the boat, wading the river, towing it along behind me. As I splash along, I see a single crimson maple leaf pressed against a rock by the current. Soon after, there's a stretch of rapids too rocky to get through, so I'm forced to carry my little canoe on my shoulders. I hike an overgrown portage trail through a shadowy forest. I'm walking through deep beds of moss, beds of ferns that have started to turn rust-colored. After that, the river opens up again. As I paddle on, the sun comes out. There's a warm wind and the sound of cicadas. On this fall day, it feels for just a moment like I found a last pool of summer. Brian Mann, NPR News in New York's Adirondack Mountains. Hey, people. This is Emma Choi, the host of the new Wednesday show, Everyone and Their Mom, from your friends at Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me podcast. It's a great place to take a break from the news and check out what everyone else is talking about. For example, this week is Romantic Monkeys. I know, but trust me. Check out Everyone and Their Mom every Wednesday in the Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me podcast feed. Today, Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin and other military leaders are on Capitol Hill answering questions from the Senate Armed Services Committee about the messy U.S. withdrawal from Afghanistan. Here are a few moments. Secretary Austin defended the August 31st deadline to withdraw troops, but acknowledged missteps, including the Trump administration's agreement with the Taliban, known as the Doha Agreement. The fact that the Afghan army that we and our partners trained simply melted away in many cases without firing a shot, took us all by surprise, and it would be dishonest to claim otherwise. We need to consider some uncomfortable truths. That we didn't fully comprehend the depth of corruption and poor leadership in the senior ranks. That we didn't grasp the damaging effect, <coughs> effect of frequent and unexplained rotations by President Ghani of his commanders that we didn't anticipate the snowball effect caused by the deals that the Taliban commanders struck with local leaders in the wake of the Doha Agreement, and that the Doha Agreement itself had a demoralizing effect on Afghan soldiers. And finally, that we failed to grasp that there was only so much for which and for whom many of the Afghan forces would fight. We provided the Afghan military with equipment and aircraft and the skills to use them. Over the years, they often fought bravely. Tens of thousands of Afghan soldiers and police died. But in the end, we couldn't provide them with the will to win, at least not all of them. And as a veteran of that war, I am personally reckoning with all of that. General Kenneth McKenzie, head of the military Central Command, said this about the Taliban's swift takeover of the country. It wasn't so much the collapse of the Afghan military as the, the collapse of the Afghan government writ large. Those two things happened together, and they were, they were um, completely linked together. So when you consider one, I think you have to think about the other. And maybe the most anticipated voice of this hearing belonged to General Mark Milley, chair of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, whose troubled relationship with President Trump is the subject of the new book, Peril, which claimed that Milley called his Chinese counterpart to alleviate fears that President Trump would attack China. Here's Milley's response. At no time. Was I attempting to change or influence the process, usurp authority, or insert myself in the chain of command? But I am expected, I am required to give my advice and ensure that the president is fully informed on military matters. I am submitting for the record a more detailed and unclassified memoranda that I believe you all now have, although late. And I welcome a thorough walkthrough on every single one of these events and I'd be happy in a classified session to talk in detail about the intelligence that drove these calls. I'm also happy to make available any email, 
phone logs, memoranda, witnesses, or anything else you need to understand these events. My oath is to support the Constitution of the United States of America against all enemies, foreign and domestic, and I will never turn my back on that oath. I firmly believe in civilian control of the military as a bedrock principle essential to the health of this republic, and I'm committed to ensuring that the military stays clear of domestic politics. Some of today's Senate testimony from General Mark Milley, General Kenneth McKenzie, and Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin. Tomorrow, all three face another round of questioning from the House Armed Services Committee. The MacArthur Foundation gave out its so-called Genius Awards today, $625,000 to 25 big thinkers, and this week we're going to be meeting many. Today, Seattle computational virologist Trevor Bedford, who used the Internet to crowdsource information about the coronavirus, helping the world understand it. And by the way, last week he was also one of several scientists who received $9 million each from the Howard Hughes Medical Institute told to just follow their wildest scientific dreams. Trevor Bedford, have you taken this in? Um, It's been a process. (laughs) Uh, Kind of an overwhelming September, trying to feel like I can contribute into the future. (laughs) Well, you better. (laughs) I mean, is there a little pressure now? Yeah, and like it's all wrapped up with the pandemic and feeling like I need to somehow try to fix COVID and it's impossible to fix it, but that's going to be the the mission at least. Right, and obviously people have faith in you. So congratulations, let's make sure we've said that. Thank you. Yeah, so did we get that even remotely right? Crowdsourced virus tracking. Yeah, I think that's pretty close. So we had back in 2015 a thing called Next Flu to try to look at how flu is circulating and help with influence of vaccine strain selection, and then we adopted that into next strain to deal with the Ebola epidemic in West Africa and the Zika epidemic in the Americas. And so by 2019, we had actually a pretty good system to take publicly shared viral genome sequence data and very quickly build an evolutionary tree or a family tree and use that tree to understand spatial spread and evolution and kind of what's going on when the first genomes for the novel coronavirus were shared publicly on January 11th in 2020, we could kind of immediately have have that built and rebuilt. And as new data was shared, rebuild things every 30 minutes and kind of have something like a real-time view of what's circulating and how the pandemic is spreading. Well, let's back up on that. You've said that you saw some things on Twitter coming from Wuhan, China, where the outbreak was. What did that tell you? Mm-hmm. So that, that timeline was basically that at the very early January, there's kind of Twitter inklings of a viral pneumonia of unknown etiology. But I couldn't do much until January 10th when the first genome became available, noticing that it is a SARS-like coronavirus, which is already scary. And knowing how quickly coronaviruses evolve, that the initial infection was only in November 2019 and had very quickly ramped And this let us understand just how much human-to-human transmission there was at a time when it's not acknowledged that there is human-to-human transmission. A couple things. First of all, when you say we got the genome data of the SARS-CoV-2, the COVID-19 coronavirus, the genome is kind of the, what, the genetic blueprint? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then you said you've crowdsourced this. You talk about building a tree. What happens? Are you plugging in or... Are other people joining you? Yeah. So the way that we work is that we need people from across the world, groups from across the world, to share their data. And during the pandemic, that's been remarkable. We're looking for particular mutations that are shared among those samples. Mm -hmm. So I see the movie, The Trevor Bedford Story. And you're looking down at a computer, and the light is shining up on your face. And we're seeing this information pop up on the screen. I mean, am I in the ballpark? Yeah, this is like, it's a tree that has a lot of like little short branches off of it. Then it's basically putting that together with results out of Imperial College London, where they're able to, from the amount of international travelers that were getting picked up with with COVID-19, 
with those two data points together, that the international travelers give you a good baseline for actual mm. infections. So we were able to estimate the number of secondary infections that one infection causes. And so we were able to then, on January 23rd, we have a, we have a public report, uh, we have an r naught of three, and three is kind of a really terrifying r naught. R naught. So it means how many infections, on average, does one infection cause? Ooh. And having an r naught of three gives you a lot of exponential growth. That is what kind of led to the pandemic very quickly spreading. That, as you said, terrifying. What was your thought in that moment? That week, mid-January, around January 20th, 2020, was rough. For a while, it felt like I had this special knowledge that I was trying to share with public health, WHO, CDC, and like kind of being alone in this knowledge. And eventually things caught up, which almost made it better in a like really tragic and ridiculous way. Well, but yeah, um, but, you're, but at least you're not alone. But I mean, you were trying to get the word out. Mm -hmm. Wow. From Seattle, you know. And talk more about this open source tool, Next Strain. You mentioned a London kicking in and Thailand kicking in. Yeah. yeah, we've continued to develop the software, and we provide views of what's going on so you can kind of look at how Delta is spreading across the world. And, and then we've done our best to make the software runnable by public health and scientists throughout the world. So there's a lot of local public health jurisdictions who are running the software on their data from kind of their local outbreaks or their mm -hmm. state level epidemics in order to kind of understand um, transmission evolution in their in their geography. Well, and now one of the things you're doing is identifying different strains of coronavirus. What are you seeing? So right now, Delta has basically taken over the world um, in a fashion that I don't think many people would have predicted back in April. And we're watching very closely for the emergence of a sublineage of Delta that has additional mutations on top of Delta that is going to be kind of the next thing to worry about. And, well, I, I imagine that people are noticing you now. <laughs> How has your life changed? It's actually gotten difficult to remember what it was like mm -hmm. before 28 months ago. It's been cycles of, of overwork and burnout, and then particular things cropping up where then it requires more attention, like when the variants first emerged. Well, and are you getting the sense that people are waiting to hear from you? And I don't know if that's a relief or if that's just a huge responsibility. Yeah, um, I, think, I think mostly responsibility. Yeah. What do you see, uh, Trevor Bevford, in the future? So if we compare SARS-CoV-2 to influenza virus, I think it's a kind of a, a helpful analogy to think about the future. The evolution of SARS-CoV-2 up to this point has been faster. And so having something that's that evolvable suggests that it will be able to kind of keep evolving. We'll need to keep updating our vaccines. That will be kind of a thing that will be happening. But then critically, this R0 parameter that we were, we were talking about right. that was three, which was terrifying back in January 2020. With Delta, it's now five or six. And flu is like two. Well, wait a minute. <laughs> so, wait a minute. That's, yeah. That is, I mean, if three was horrifying, what's five or six? It, yeah. <laughs> um, it means that like, like this is why places like Vietnam that were able to control the original form have struggled with Delta. Because of this high rate of evolution, it suggests that you'd have something that's the worst of our seasonal respiratory diseases. I expect there to be a, a winter wave this season. However, we had a number of infections kind of pulled forward by this Delta late summer wave, where that's created its own immunity. 5% of the U.S. has perhaps gotten Delta at this point. So it actually might not be so bad. But looking forward to 2022, 2023, once this is endemic, that's kind of where my, my comparison with flu comes in, where it's like a severe flu season every winter. Every winter. Th then there's the known unknowns, other variants that might come along. Mm -hmm. As the world continues to build up immunity through natural infection vaccination, evolutionary pressure shifts more to escape immunity. There'll need eventually to be vaccine updates to deal yeah. with that, yeah. that evolution. So here you are, Trevor Bedford, a winner of the MacArthur Award and also one of the recipients of the prestigious Howard Hughes Medical Institute Award, which brings you $9 million. We talked about the responsibility these awards bring. What about the relief of having income to do your work. Yeah, this is the scientific dream of having sustained funding that is able to be directed in kind of whatever fashion you'd want. And that's amazing. It's really 
been difficult for me to reconcile that with feeling like this is coming out of my work on the pandemic and like it's, yeah, it's just hard to accept things given that it came under such terrible circumstances. Oh, I, so you're feeling like you don't want to benefit from the global pain caused by COVID. Yeah. Well, rest assured, <laughs> the rest of us are saying, great, because you'll be uh, using that money to continue your good work, to alert the world what's going on. So Thank congratulations you. to you. That's Trevor Befford, computational biologist at the Fred Hutchison Cancer Center in Seattle. Best to you, Trevor. Thank you so much for speaking with us about your good work. Thank you for having me. Is it actually possible to create a safe and engaging social media app that kids love? That's the dilemma facing Facebook, which owns Instagram. Adam Masiri, the head of Instagram, announced yesterday that the company is pausing plans to create a separate version of Insta for kids. There's a lot of concern over what social media is doing to our kids' mental health. Now, we're going to take a step back, and we're going to take that time to talk and listen to parents, safety experts, and researchers, and get to more consensus about how exactly to move forward. But we're also going to take some of the work that we did for Instagram kids, specifically parental controls, and bring them to teens more broadly. Sarah Fryer is here. She's the author of No Filter, the story inside of Instagram. Welcome. Thank you for having me. Facebook referred to this as a pause, but how likely is it that they actually go forward? I mean, some Democrats in Congress are calling on the company to abandon Instagram kids altogether. Well, I would even question whether it's a pause. I think that the company has been trying to build products for younger users for so many years now, especially for teens. And when it comes to Instagram, if you think kids aren't using Instagram, talk to nine-year-olds, talk to 10-year-olds, they and their friends are on Instagram, they're using it. I reported my book that they used to have teens come to do these round tables um, back in 2015 where they would ask them about their usage of the app. And and so they've been moving younger in their focus. I think that we are going to see it happen sometime. They just might wait for a more friendly PR environment to make the change. Right. This is interesting what you're saying here, because I want to break down some of the reasons why something like this hasn't gained traction. A big part of the concern specifically around an app for kids is that internal Facebook documents show, the Wall Street Journal actually reported on this, that that Instagram was harming the mental health of teenage girls in particular. And as you mentioned, kids are already there, though. They're already lying about their age in order to get on an app um, that is not for them because they want to be at a place where they don't have controls. So how, how do you think Facebook is going to address all of this? going forward? I think Facebook is going to keep experimenting with what they can do without making as many people mad. You know, they respond to these crises by bringing their executives out there to say, hey, listen, we have the best of intentions. We're doing this in consultation with experts. And then reports like the Wall Street Journals come out and say, actually, the company has been disingenuous about this. They knew it was harmful, but didn't do anything about it. And that is just the pattern that we've seen from Facebook Inc. over the past, you know, more than a decade of of apologies and backtracking. We are still probably going to see some version of the app in the future, but they may have to figure out how to remarket it. It may not be called Instagram Kids. They're trying to figure out how do we make this something that people are not afraid of. Can we parse out the disingenuous part of it, though? Because other social media companies have grappled with this, too. I mean, TikTok created what it called a limited separate app experience for users under 13, but they can't share videos or comment on other people's videos or even message people. And YouTube has a kid's version, too. So I'm just wondering, like the success of these types of apps, is it a good business proposition? It absolutely is, because what you're trying to do is you're trying to build a habit. All these apps lure you into the network as soon as they can because that's the strength of the product. It's like showing them their favorite toothpaste. They're going to use it for the rest of their lives. 
Well, to your point, I mean, critics like Democratic Representative Kathy Castor of Florida has compared these kids' apps to how tobacco companies in the past marketed to young people to get kids hooked early. What's your sense, though? I mean, we've talked around this conversation about whether or not it's viable, the ways that they can make a viable app, but is it even possible to create a version of Instagram that avoids the problems critics are warning? The thing about Instagram that has led to all of this anxiety, to all of this comparison of oneself to others that has become so toxic for teens, it's all in the way the app is actually designed to incentivize you to come back. It's the follower count. It's the comments. It's the filters that encourage you to present your life as more beautiful and perfect than it actually is. When it comes to young people, what do you do? Do you take out the measurements? Do you take out the the images? <laughs> what does it end up being in a way that can be safe or can be comfortable for that age demographic? And, and I think it's really tough for the company to go that direction because on the other hand, they are leaning deeper and deeper into the creator world, the people who are using Instagram semi-professionally or professionally. And for them, they're adding more metrics, they're adding more editing tools, more ways to compare their content. And so all those things that really lead to anxiety are getting juiced up in some sense by the company. Sarah Fryer is an editor for Bloomberg and the author of No Filter, the inside story of Instagram. Thank you so much, Sarah. Thank you for having me. And Here and Now is a production of NPR and WBUR. I'm Tanya Mosley. I'm Robin Young. It's Here and Now. Here and Now.